Well, that is a rather personal testimonial, which I hadn't expected to precede uh, my remarks. Uh, but it does set the context within which each of you has come here today. Each of you has a similar story. And that is why we are such a powerful group. As Tracy said, from 900, 900 people, I was going to say from 900 countries, 900 people from 54 countries in comparison with 560 in Chicago last year from just 40. And this meeting being held here in India, as Gita and Tracy pointed out, is a very significant symbol in itself. Because India is really representative of the global issues that we have to tackle. And nowhere like India are people trying to tackle these issues so as to deal with hundreds of millions of people rather than just thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions. And so the fact that we are here in a country where impact investment is taking root to decide how we go about finding solutions to these massive problems that our world has never faced at such scale before, that is what is going to occupy us over the next two and three days. The meeting comes at a very important time. If in Chicago we could say that impact investment has come to the mainstream as a conversation, that stream has turned into a torrent of attention now. The Financial Times publishes a magazine solely on impact investment. The Guardian publishes a supplement. Everywhere, people are poring over what we are doing. And it puts us in the position of riding on the back of a tiger. As the Chinese uh, saying says, person who rides on back of tiger can't get off. We have to deliver. We have to lead. We have to solve. We have to implement. And that's why we've come together in these next two or three days to do exactly that. Now, if you look at the world around us, the broad ecosystem of impact investment, all the figures we can see point to accelerating growth. If you take the broadest measure of all, the amount of money that has signed up to the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, which, as you know, state that you have to take social and environmental considerations into account when making investment decisions. In just the last year, the amount that has signed up has gone from 62 trillion to 90 trillion. If you look at ESG investing, where the intention is to do no harm environmentally or socially for the most part, the amount of money that is estimated by the Sustainable Investment Alliance is today 22 trillion, 22 trillion, up from 16 trillion just two years ago. And if you look at our impact investment world, the figures the GIN publishes from the survey of uh, its members, which are only perhaps 75 or 80 percent of the market, point to a doubling of impact investment over the last couple of years to 230 billion from 114 in Chicago. And if you look at the number of social and development impact bonds across the world, we could announce 87 in Chicago. And on impact, I announced 118, and we launched another one on veterans in the United States, which Tracy, who spoke before, is responsible for just before this summit. And if you look at our own activities, the number of our national advisory boards, our revolutionary councils, the vanguard of our revolution. We had 17 in Chicago, and we have 21 today, plus the EU. And 
we have another 11 in the pipeline, from China all the way through to Zambia, across the world. All of those 11 countries, I'm proud to say, are represented here today. We've been very busy since Chicago. We've been working flat out, just as Amit and uh, Sukanya and Shefali and Chris and, and Meg have worked flat out to put the summit together. We have tried not just to push the concept of impact investment across the world through our NABs, but also to catalyze activity, grassroots up. Revolutions don't happen top down. Revolutions happen bottom up. And so we've put a huge amount of effort into doing things at scale that can really begin to change our system. The first is to work on outcomes funds. If we want social and development impact bonds, which are such a powerful tool for innovation, the equivalent of venture capital for tech, if we want them to get to scale, we cannot customize each one. We have to create outcomes funds of a billion dollars, which are capable of contracting for 100 or 150 social impact bonds in a place or for a theme or both. And I'm delighted to announce that we have made great progress with the African Middle East Outcomes Fund that Amal Kabul, who spoke about yesterday, leads. We are about to publish our prospectus, and we can see, speaking to governments, speaking to social sector organizations that would deliver services in education, speaking to profit with purpose businesses, that this can really bring about a revolution in education that can show the way to dealing with 800 million uneducated or ill-educated young people. The outcomes funds, by being able to sign for a social impact bond, will reduce the amount of time a social impact bond requires from 18 months today to three to four months. The other bit that is going to enable that is the creation of social impact bond funds of a couple of hundred million each. Opposite the billion dollar outcomes fund, we will find five, six hundred million dollars in social impact bond funds that look for entrepreneurs who are able to find innovative solutions and who get paid according to the success that they achieve, measuring the success not as their inputs or their activities, but as the outcomes, the improvement in the education of young people. We're doing the same in India, a billion dollar outcomes fund. We've set up social finance, we've catalyzed the setting up of social finance with amazing partners in India to launch the Outcomes Fund for India, and also to launch for education, and also to launch a fund of funds for impact debt. We're catalyzing another billion dollar Latin American fund of funds for impact debt. And so, bottom up, we are beginning to introduce new models at scale that will change thinking and will change lives. But I set out in Chicago a number of objectives that we have to achieve if we are going to get to tipping point by 2020. And tipping point was defined as getting 100 financial institutions allocating 5 to 10 percent of investment portfolios to impact investment, 50 foundation endowments doing the same, 50 of the Fortune 500 companies measuring their impact and reporting on it, 10% of startups having impact as an integral part of their business model, 10% of social organizations relying on impact investment for more than 10% of their, of their income. And so as we sit here today, and we take the measure of our progress, 
While it's difficult to get reliable data, and the GIN is making an effort next year to give us more reliable data on the investment front, but there is a big challenge which we faced in the venture capital industry in its early days, and the private equity industry afterwards, which is that we need reliable data in order to know exactly where we're going and in order to persuade people that we're going to the right place. So it's one of the objectives for the year ahead to improve that. But if we look at the data that we can find, the data is pretty clear. We've made a lot of progress on the investor side. You can count 30 pension funds across the world from the biggest pension fund in the world, the Japan pension fund with $1.4 trillion in one fund alone, to the PGGM fund with $300 billion in in Holland, which has made a $20 billion allocation to ESG and impact investing. We can see 30 funds across the world, more in Europe than in the United States, although in the United States, CalSERS and CalPERS, two of the biggest funds in, in the world, are on that track. We haven't got measurement into that, and I'll be speaking about that in, in, in a moment. It's ESG investing, but it's going in the right direction we can achieve a lot more by 2020. But if we look at the progress with foundations, we have to admit that it's slow. It's slow, despite the efforts of Darren Walker and the Council of Foundations that he has put uh, together, impact investment is progressing slowly there. If uh, we look at entrepreneurs, we see a much better picture. Young people today will regularly include impact in their presentations to raise money. Getting to 10% of startups doing what I was saying, I think is uh, totally feasible. Big business, apart from a couple of leaders who are very outspoken about it, like Paul Pullman and um, Emmanuel Faber, Paul Pullman of Unilever, Emmanuel Faber of Danone, uh, on the whole, the big business scene is waiting to see what investors and consumers and uh, employees want them um, to do. And if I ask myself the question, why haven't we made more progress? I believe there are two reasons that we need to address in our meeting today. The first is a very simple one, and we faced it in venture capital. Nobody knows exactly what impact investment means. There's great confusion about it. The term has got established with the backing of very different constituencies, and very few people can actually say this is what impact investment stands for. That's the milestone we're crossing with this meeting. With this meeting, we have on impact you could call it our manifesto. For the rest of the world, we're calling it a guide. It's the manifesto to the impact revolution. It sets out our eight beliefs, and it sets out how each of the different elements of impact investment fit together to lead us to impact economies that are capable of improving the majority of lives and the planet. We are connecting that to a digital campaign for the first time. We've hired Purpose, which is a campaign agency. We have a hashtag, we have a site. Please visit the site and start tweeting and sending emails and sending Instagram pictures about your activities, about your views, about the summit, about the content of On Impact. We have to make our case much more simply than we have done before. The second big reason why we haven't made more progress is impact measurement. The measurement of impact itself is crucial to the success of our endeavors. If impact investment is a rocket, then impact measurement is our navigation system. Until we can show what impact has been created and compare it across different initiatives, across different funds, 
across uh, different companies, it will be extremely difficult to persuade investors that they are actually optimizing risk, return, and impact, and that they're getting something more for their money than just a, a, a profit. Now, there are no less than 150 different initiatives across the world to measure impact. And most of them have focused on measuring the impact of a specific intervention. But that, in my view, will not lead to the solution. And that's why the GSG has teamed up with the Impact Management Project, which Bridges has uh, led so brilliantly over the last several years, which includes today more than a thousand organizations. And Clara Barbie, I believe, is here with us. She's certainly speaking later in our summit. More than a thousand organizations where a consensus is being created about what the destination should be. And I would like to set out a new destination. The new destination is that every company will have to publish alongside its financial accounts, impact-weighted accounts, accounts that take into account the impact of their products through their sales, the impact of their employment, whether they have diversity, whether they're employing child labor, and if they are doing well, to see a reduction in that line, and if they're doing badly, to see an increase in that cost. And then to do the same for the raw materials that they have. Are they water neutral? Are they plastic neutral? Are they land neutral? Are they CO2 neutral? To the extent that they're doing worse than they should be, those costs would go up too. And we would come down to a bottom line, which is an impact-weighted profit to which you can apply a governance coefficient. Does the company publish impact-weighted accounts? Does the company report on its impact? Does it have impact governance within it? That, in my view, is the future. It's achievable. We are going to set up a task force with UNDP, which has the interest in seeing this move forward because UNDP is interested in having the SDGs receive funding from the private sector. There's a two and a half trillion dollar shortfall for the SDGs a year. And so UNDP is interested in finding ways in which the private sector can connect, but in the same way that in developed economies, they're not going to do so unless they are measured. The same is true for emerging economies. Big companies will do, as I said, what their shareholders and employees and consumers desire them to do until we can hold them to account for the impact they create, they will do little. And so, what is the future if we do achieve a better understanding of what we're doing and better measurement of impact? Well, I did some numbers to look at where impact investment could be in 2030 if we did have these two elements in place. There's already $22 trillion of investment going into ESG, most of it in public companies. If we had just 20% of public companies reporting on their impact in the way that I have described, that would represent $20 trillion in itself. If 10% of the bond market was green bonds and social bonds, where you measured the impact created instead of just hoped for it, that would be another eight trillion. If social impact bonds and development impact bonds accounted for just 1% of the bond market, that would be a trillion. If 10% of private equity, where we're seeing real movement now with the TPG Rise Fund of $2 billion being followed by another impact equity fund of $3 billion, numbers unheard of before TPG entered the field. 
Bain Capital, $400 million. The Partners Group in Europe, $1.2 billion. KKR launching a billion dollar ESG fund. If private equity was just 10% in impact, and it's likely to be a lot more than that, that would be another 300, 400 billion dollars. If 30% of venture capital was going to impact, that would be another 300 billion dollars. And if real estate and infrastructure investments measuring impact had 10%, that would be another 250. The total, my friends, is 30 trillion dollars. 30 trillion dollars would represent 20% of assets under management in 2030. That's enough to put us on the road to impact economies. Economies where generally accepted impact principles sit alongside generally accepted accounting principles. Where municipalities, where cities, where governments measure their impact. Where every business and investment decision is made on the basis of risk, return and impact where it's no longer acceptable to say, I am in business to make profit only. And so we are on a very ambitious but unachievable path. Impact investment is the way to impact economies. Impact economies are within our reach. Imagine a world where we don't just avoid doing harm, but where we actually strive, all of us, to do measurable good. Imagine a world where inequality is shrinking, where natural resources are being regenerated, where people are able to unleash their full potential. There has never been a more urgent time or a greater need to bring these changes about, to shift the world from risk return to risk return impact. The time is right now. We have the will, we have the way, and preserving our planet and ending the blight of billions of lives depends on our success. So let's do it. <clears throat>